gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can gather together for this, this course uh, on, on Mark's gospel. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to be our saviour and king. And thank you for this precious opportunity that we have to uh, come together from different places online here uh, to dig deeper into your word, to know the Lord Jesus better, and to be challenged in our living for him. So please uh, bless our time. Uh, help us uh, to, to concentrate well after, after work and after whatever we've been doing today. Help me to teach faithfully and clearly. And may you be glorified as a result of our, our sessions here. And uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I want us to, uh, we're going to be doing a bit of an overview as we, as we start off here this evening and uh, thinking about uh, what the Gospels are, um, how you read them, uh, and so on. Uh, of course, this course, we're going to be focusing especially on Mark's Gospel, but tonight we're going to start a bit more general with the Gospels generally um, and, and then zoom our way into to, to reading Mark's Gospel. Uh, but the sessions are going to be a bit interactive, so I'm going, to, I'm going to put you in groups to kind of warm us up a little bit this evening. Your friend asks you, uh, who is Jesus and why, does, why did he have to die? Who is Jesus and why did he have to die? What's your two-minute answer to that question? Uh, we're looking at the Gospels then, and it's always a good question to ask, what is the Gospel? And, and uh, I think sometimes when we say that, what is the Gospel? Uh, sometimes people think that we're, sometimes people answer the question, they say Mark, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, or John, right? Um, the Gospels. But that's not what, we're, not what we're talking about when we say we're studying uh, the Gospels. As we'll see, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these, these are the Gospels, what we might call with a capital G. Uh, but the Gospel itself is something different. It's a message, uh, that is proclaimed. The word gospel means good news, right, or momentous news. So in the ancient world, uh, uh, a messenger would come running back from the battle to deliver an announcement of great significance, you know, we won the battle or whatever. That would, that, that's what the word gospel was. It was an announcement of, 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 of good news. Um, so it could be a, a word that was used by uh, non-believers as well at that time. But when we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about the good news about Jesus Christ, right? And at the heart of the gospel is who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Uh, a good summary of the gospel is the gospel is uh, the good news that Christ died as our savior and was raised as our king. Christ died as our savior. He was raised as our king. Uh, and a good place to see that is in... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses uh, 1 to 6. So we're going to look at that just briefly, and we're going to think about the who, the what, and the why uh, in, uh, in that passage. Let me just share the Bible onto, onto my screen here to make it easy for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're looking at verses 1 to 6. So Paul writes this, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Uh, and so we see here that the gospel is something that saves us if we believe it. We have to hold fast to it. And this is the message that Paul received, that he passed on, and, and we need to cling to. Uh, and he says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So this is the most important. This is the central message of the Bible. And you would have seen this in Bible overview, those who have taken that. Who is the gospel about? It's about Christ. You see that here, right? Christ died for our sins. And you remember from Bible overview that Christ, uh, it, it, that word means king, God's promised king, the one who will rule over God's kingdom forever. And we're told four things about what Christ would do. Uh, we're told that he died, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared, right? So at the heart of the gospel is the news that Jesus died and rose again. And we know that he was really dead because he was buried. And we know that he was the same Jesus who died was also raised from the dead because he appeared to lots of people uh, at the same time. So who's the gospel about? It's about Christ. 
what about him? It's especially about his death and resurrection. Uh, and then we're also told the meaning of it here, right? Christ died for our sins. Sin is rejection of God. The punishment for sin is death. And Christ died for our sins. That means he swapped places with us. He, we should die for our sins, but Christ swapped places. He died instead uh, of, of us. It was a substitution. Some of us stayed up quite late watching the World Cup uh, football recently when there's a substitution one player goes off one player goes on in their place jesus is our substitute yeah uh, and not only did he uh did he die for our sins he did so in accordance with the scriptures so it's the old testament that helps us to understand the meaning of the death of jesus and also helps us to understand the meaning of the resurrection of jesus and to put it simply the resurrection of Jesus means that he is the Christ. He is God's promised king who rules over uh, uh, all the nations uh, forever. So we put that all together then. What is the gospel about? It's about who Jesus is and what Jesus done, has done. He died as our savior and he was raised again as our king. Right? Uh, next, we might talk about the response to the gospel right it's important to understand that the gospel is a message but it's a message that requires a response and we see the response uh quite clearly in mark chapter one uh this is the first words of jesus in mark's gospel uh and uh we read in verse 14 after john was arrested jesus came into galilee proclaiming the gospel of god known as the gospel is jesus central message and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. So the right response to the gospel is repentance and belief, or what we might call faith. Uh, what's repentance? Uh, repentance is a U-turn. Uh, Malaysians are generally quite familiar with U-turns when they're driving, whether it's legal or not, right? But a, a, a U-turn is where you stop going one direction, you stop, you turn around, and you go back the other way. That's repentance. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. See, if Jesus is raised again as the king of the nations, he's going to rule forever, then that means that I can't be king of my own life anymore, and I certainly can't worship other gods. No, I need to stop, repent, turn around, and let Jesus be the king of my life. Uh, and I also need to believe, right? The word believe, it just means to trust or rely or depend. So if Jesus is my savior, if he's the one who's died in my place so I can be forgiven and be made right with God, then I need to stop trusting in myself and my own good works to get myself to heaven. I need to stop trusting in other gods and I need to trust in Jesus alone, um, his death alone as my savior. So the gospel is about who Jesus is and what he's done. He's died as our savior. He's been raised as our king. The response to the gospel, repentance, turn to Jesus as king, and faith, belief, trust in Jesus to save us from our sins. Uh, then we could talk about the, the implications of the gospel. Uh, and again, sometimes we get confused here. I think if you have, sometimes you ask someone, what is the gospel? They're going to say things like, Oh, well, it's about God's love for us, so it's about eternal life, or it's about um, that we can go to heaven, or these, these things. Those are not the gospel itself, right? The gospel itself is all about Jesus, his death and resurrection. But those are all the blessings that flow from the gospel. See, as we hear the gospel message and we respond rightly in repentance and faith, that means that we can then enjoy order the blessings of the gospel, like we can experience God's love for us, he's, we have his Holy Spirit, eternal life, we can um, have the hope of, of, of going to heaven and, and all of those uh, wonderful blessings uh, that, uh, that we have, right? So we've got the gospel itself focused on Jesus, our response, repentance and faith, and then the implications, all the blessings uh, that flow from putting our trust uh, in Jesus. So that's the gospel message. So what then are the gospels, right? And now we're talking about with a capital uh, G, right? Uh, let me share my slides again at this point. 
what are the gospels with a capital uh, with a capital G? And essentially, what the gospels are is the gospel message written down. Let me say that again. Essentially, what the gospels are is the gospel message uh, written uh, down. So first, uh, at, at, at the core, we have the events of Jesus uh, of Jesus' life. Um, uh, of course, at the beginning, there was no New Testament, was there? There was no Gospels. They were written later. Uh, they had the Old Testament, and then Jesus came, and he, he, he did his miracles and his teaching. He died on the cross. He rose again. He appeared to the disciples. They, these are all the events, right? And this is what the early apostles went out to preach. They, 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 they went around the ancient uh, world, especially the Apostle Paul, telling them, telling people that Christ had died as their savior, he'd risen as their king, and they needed to repent and believe. And of course, our, you know, the ancient world was turned upside down by this glorious message, and it has come down to us uh, today. But eventually, uh, the apostles is getting to the end of their, of, of their life, uh, say about 60 AD or so, we've already got quite a number of the uh, New Testament epistles by that time. Of course, we've got the Old Testament too. The Gospels already spread uh, quite a lot through the Roman en Empire. There's some persecution happening in the early church and the apostles themselves, some have already died and some are getting towards the end of their life. Uh, and so it comes to the point where the gospel message is going to be written down um, in, these, uh, in these form, right? So uh, the gospels then... Uh, provide us uh, with an explanation of the events of Jesus' life, his death, uh, and his, his resurrection. They help us to understand what the gospel message um, is all about. Indeed, they preach the gospel message to us. So that's why you, how you can think about the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They preach the gospel, right? Uh, and that's why they're so good for us as we seek to share the gospel with others. Like if you're going to try and reach out to a non-believing family or friend, then one of the best things that you can do is open up one of the gospels with them. And Mark is always a favorite because it's so short um, uh, and you can get through it so, uh, so, so quickly. Yeah. Um, right. So another question people often ask is what type of writing is the gospels or what is the genre of the gospels? Uh, you know, a genre is a type of writing like poetry or narrative or laws or there's different types of uh, literature that you find in, 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 in the Bible. And people often ask, well, what, what, what type of writing is the Gospels? Because if you can know what type of writing it is, then that means that you're going to read it properly. Because the way you read a piece of poetry is quite different to the way that you read a law textbook, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're quite different mediums, right? So we want to know what kind of writing we're looking at so that we read it um, as it was uh, intended. Now, there are a few different ways that it's often uh, put forward, acts, memoirs, or biographies. Um, acts, this is kind of like what we find in the book of Acts to some degree, right? Uh, this genre is about recording the fame, you know, talking about a famous uh, character and their achievements. So you might write the acts of Julius Caesar to record all the great things that um, that that he does and uh that's kind of true isn't it i mean the, the gospels do fit that to some degree jesus is a famous character it talks about the main highlights in his uh in his life but it focuses on his death which is quite unusual for the genre although of course mark's going to present that as his greatest achievement to us yeah uh so sometimes people talk about it as a memoir and that's kind of the famous sayings, uh, sayings of a famous teacher. Uh, but then again, if you look at Mark's gospel, it actually doesn't contain a whole lot of Jesus' teaching. Um, there's a fair bit in chapter four with the parable of the sower and so on. There's some more teaching in, the, uh, in chapter 13 as he talks about the, his return. But there's not a lot of direct teaching in Mark's gospel, especially, you know, especially compared to the other gospels. Uh, so that's it's not really a good fit either um the third one is a biography and a biography is uh you know you basically you record the history of of someone's life normally chronological um but that's not really doesn't really work either because uh 
the, the Gospels are actually mainly about Jesus' uh, death, right? Um, I mean, Mark's Gospel doesn't even mention anything about Jesus' birth, his childhood, his, um, his life of working as a carpenter or anything until his ministry starts with, in, uh, at 30 years old um, and his baptism with John the Baptist. There's nothing before that. Even the resurrection is treated very briefly. In, Mark, in Mark's gospel, you only see the empty tomb. Um, you don't even meet the resurrected Jesus in Mark's gospel. Of course, you do in Luke, uh, Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, so it, it's strange, strange to have a biography that's really only focused on a short period of time. I think in Mark's gospel, uh, the three years of Jesus' ministry is covered in about 10 chapters, chapters 1 to 10. Uh, but most of it, the last six chapters or so, is about the last one week of his life, uh, especially the last 24 hours of his, uh, of his life. So there's a disproportionate focus on Jesus' death, uh, so much so that the Gospels are often called a passion narrative with an extended introduction. Uh, passion narrative, passion, the, that word means, uh, talks about suffering, Jesus' suffering. Uh, a passion narrative with an extended introduction. So saying it's really all about the death of Jesus, just with some introductory material to prepare you for it. Right? So biography doesn't really work as a, as a genre to describe it either. Um, so what are the Gospels? And the best way to talk about them really is that they're, they're a new genre on their own, uh, what, we, what we would call um, a gospel, right? And what, what is, what's a gospel? A gospel is a piece of literature that preaches the gospel, right? The gospel message. Uh, and that's why the gospels is all about Jesus, because that's what the gospel message is about. And that's why there's a disproportionate focus on the death and the resurrection of Jesus in particular, because that's what the gospel message is all about. It's about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's why the gospel, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're, what they record is trying to bring about a response in us, the response of repentance and faith, so that we will receive all the blessings of the gospel. Um, that's the best way to think about the gospels. They're a unique type of writing there's nothing else like them in the ancient world really they have these resemblances to other things but they're really a unique piece of writing that is uh that helps to preach the gospel to those who uh to to hear it or another way of saying this is that they are the gospels uh the gospel message written down let me just pause there would you like to ask any any questions so far Can I have a question? Great, go ahead, yeah. So in real life, right, I have one uh, Malay friend that I respect and uh, we feel so safe. Okay, so uh, we have, there's only one gospel message, right? The, the good news, Christ died as our savior, rules as our king. There's only one gospel message, lower, small g, right? But of course we have four, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And often as you open your Bible, it will say something like the gospel according to Matthew or the gospel according to Mark or Luke or John. Notice it's the gospel, the gospel. There's only one gospel, but it's Matthew's perspective or Mark's perspective or Luke's perspective. Four complementary uh, perspectives. And uh, it's actually great that we have four gospels because what we'll see in a moment is that they're written for different purposes uh they have their own kind of emphasis or themes i mean they have certain things a lot, a lot of things in common but uh but they're writing to bring that gospel message to particular audiences to, to achieve particular uh particular things um and and so that's that's a real uh, a real treasure for us to have the four uh, Gospels. Now, let's just have a bit of a chat about that. What are some of the, uh, the similarities and the differences 
between the four gospels? What are some of the similarities and the differences uh, between uh, the four gospels? Any, any suggestions? What things are similar, do you think? It's all about Jesus. They're all about Jesus, yes. Good one. What else? I think they are uh, going. Uh, they focus on Jesus' death and more importantly, his resurrection. Yeah, yeah they, they all devote most of their space to the, the last part of Jesus' life. True, the death and resurrection. Excellent. Jordan? Uh, I was going to uh, say that too, actually, but, but I have to think of another one. Uh, okay. And I think the, the other one is the uh, the synoptics. They, they always start with John the Baptist. Yeah, and actually uh, John's, John's gospel also starts with John the Baptist. Too, yeah. Which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, true. So there's lots, of, uh, there's lots of events and there's lots of characters um, that are repeated in the four gospels. They all have unique material too, but there's lots of similar material too. Yeah, what else? I think all four Gospels have um, recorded uh, what Jesus did, as did, especially his miracles, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Now, some of them have more miracles, like the synoptics. Some of them have le less miracles, like, like John's Gospel, but they all have miracles, yes. So what are some of the differences? I guess John would be the, the most different since we categorize it as an, uh, an entire a different one <laughs> yeah john john's gospel is quite different in fact uh that there's some common material between john's gospel and the other gospels like the feeding of the five thousand walking on the water it's the death and resurrection of jesus but most of the material in john is actually not in the synoptic gospels um and even where it is covering similar material like the feeding of the five thousand or even the death and resurrection of jesus the material that it has is different right um and I think the reason for that, if you're wondering why, is because John's gospel is written last and there's already three gospels doing that. So John is trying to tell other things or include other things that are not in the other gospels. I think it's deliberate on his part to do that. Yeah. Other differences? Matthew's gospel is more for Jewish uh, background. Yeah, so Matthew's gospel seems to be more for Jews. It starts with a genealogy in the first chapter. It's got a lot more um, e explicit quotations from the Old Testament than the other um, than the other gospels. Yeah, right. I mean, there's other things we could say, right? They, they sometimes they arrange the material differently. Matthew likes to have big blocks of teaching, you know, like Sermon on the Mount, three chapters of it. You won't find that in in Luke or or, the, or, or Mark and John. Um, uh, so he does it that way. Um, you know, L Luke has his own kind of infancy narrative, which is different from Matthew's one. Um, and there's, there's lots of difference that we could say. And in fact, what we'll see in a moment, just briefly, is that even where they're telling the same story, exactly the same story, even though there's similar in so many ways, there is little differences um, that reflect their own emphasis and purpose, right? Uh, so it's always good to think, what is, in, for this course, Mark, what is Mark's purpose? Or why is Mark particular writing this? Sometimes we like to compare with the other Gospels and try and fill in the extra details. That can be a mistake because once you do that, you stop listening to what Mark is saying um, because you're also hearing voices from Luke and John and so on. So it's good to hear the unique perspective that uh, that whatever gospel you're studying is bringing so let's uh, let's go to the next thing then and we're going to think about uh the uh uh the purpose right the audience and, and and purpose so there's a couple of verses there uh obviously to really do this properly you you probably need to you know read through the whole gospel and so on but we're just just as an intro really for this evening I wanted to read those uh, few verses there and see what do they tell you about who do you think the audience is? You think it's you know Jewish audience or Gentile audience, um, and what do you think the purpose of the gospel writer is in writing his particular 
uh, gospel. Let me uh, put us in breakout rooms. So I'll just give you about five minutes to discuss that together. Yeah? Okay, so you're probably really just touching the iceberg there, isn't it? But uh, you can see how even just from looking at those few small verses that they are different, aren't they? So, um, I mean, Luke, Luke and John tell us their purpose in writing specifically. You know, Luke says that he's writing to Theophilus and he's writing so that you may have certainty of the things you have been taught. So um, Luke's purpose is to, to make us certain about who Jesus is and so on. Um, John, again, tells us his purpose explicitly at the end, that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And it just turns out those are the three main things that you find in John's gospel, right? The identity of Jesus, um, the nature of uh, faith, and, uh, and, and having life in his name or eternal life. That John has a lot to say about those three topics um, in partic particular. Matthew doesn't give us a purpose statement. Um, uh, but the way that he opens with the genealogy and so on, uh, I mean, Jesus the, uh, descended from Abraham and David and so on. It's quite clear that he wants to present us Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. He ends, of course, with the Great Commission in chapter 28. So it's the Jewish Messiah who's going to be worshipped among all the nations. That seems to be his purpose in particular. Uh, Mark, we'll, we'll come to it just in a moment. Um, uh, but, you know, if we were talking about the audiences, it seems like Matthew and John seem to have a more Jewish audience in mind. Mark and Luke seem to have a more Gentile audience in mind. You know, I could give you a long argument about why that's the case. I mean, Luke's not too hard. Theophilus is a Greek name. Uh, um, so uh, it, it's the most... Uh, you know, it's a highly sophisticated in terms of its Greek and the, these kinds of things. It has a Roman style to it and all kinds of things, right? But uh, Mark, Mark explains some of the Jewish traditions. Like if you get into Mark chapter 7 and it talks about, it explains how the, the Jews used to, to do all these ritual washings. So he doesn't assume that, uh, that we are familiar with those things, which if he was writing to Jews, he wouldn't need to do that. Um, you know, Matthew, again, quoting heavily from the Old Testament, assumes that his readers are familiar, very familiar with that. Um, and, uh, and, and then John. So we, we, we could, that, that seems to be their special audience. But of course, they're preaching the gospel to everyone, right? Um, even Matthew, the so-called most Jewish of the gospels, have, it ends with the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. He's clearly concerned that the gospel goes to the nations, not just to the Jews, you see. So um, you, you, can't push this, you can't push this too far. We're just saying that they may have a, a specific group in mind, just as you maybe would for, for a sermon. Um, you know, when you're preaching a sermon, of course, you're preaching to everyone who's there. Um, but you might also tailor the ser sermon to a specific group. If there happens to be more young adults or the more elderly people, then that, that maybe that shapes how you deliver the sermon, you see. And, um, I think that's a good way of, of, of thinking about it. Okay. So with that in mind, now let's uh, leave John's gospel to the side. Let's now look at the synoptics, and then eventually we will come to focus only on Mark itself. Okay? Uh, so why are they called the synoptic gospels? That word synoptic, it's, it's a transliteration of the Greek word. It means seen together. Right? And it's really appropriate, isn't it? Because it's basically acknowledging that there is so many um, similarities between Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke. They have a very similar way of presenting things in their structure. Um, they generally have a geographical structure where we start with uh, Jesus moving around in Galilee. There's a journey towards Jerusalem and then his death and resurrection. John's completely different. In John's gospel, Jesus goes to Jerusalem multiple times. Um, uh, in fact, that's probably one of the structuring devices in John, that these cycles related on Jesus' visits to Jerusalem. But in the Synoptics, Jesus only goes to Jerusalem once. It's a journey um, to Jerusalem. 
Um, the content, again, many, many of the events, the sayings, the parables, the healings, the teachings is common. Um, the tone or, or the, the pace is similar. So the synoptics, you get these short little episodes, isn't it? Um, you know, Jesus did this or he taught this and then we move to the next one, we move to the next one. It's very fast paced where John, you, you know, he will spend a whole chapter talking about one incident in, in a lot of detail. Right. So I, I think a good way of, uh, of seeing this is to, uh, to put three of the gospels side by side with the same episode. And now we'll see in a moment that the turning point or the pivot, the, you know, the central, uh, yeah, yeah in, in each of the synoptic gospels is when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, right? That in, uh, in Matthew's gospel, that's chapter 16. In Mark, it's chapter 8. And in Luke, it's, it's chapter 9. Now, even by just saying the chapters there, you can see that the placement's quite different, isn't it? I mean, uh, Matthew has got 15 chapters of material before we get to that turning point, which is far more than, than, than Mark or Luke had. Um, Luke's going to have loads of material after the turning point, which Matthew doesn't and, um, and Mark doesn't. Uh, but they all have this episode, this turning point there, and it's, it's very significant uh, for, all, uh, for all three of them. <laughs> Let me just mute the background noise. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let me share my screen and we can see the three of these uh, side by side. Hopefully the writing is not too small for us. Okay, now a few things that we can notice here straight away. I mean, even the headings is the same, right? Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ. Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ. Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ. Now, uh, I'm going to read through Luke's one just because it's the shortest, right? So we can get a sense of the material here, right? Now, it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who did the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Uh, but others say, Elijah and others, but one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels? But I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Okay? So you can see that it's actually three main sections here. And this, make, by the way, makes a really great evangelistic sermon, right? The first section, who is Jesus? He's the Christ. Second section, why has Jesus come? He's come to suffer, die, and be raised again. And then the third question, what does it mean to follow him? You need to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. That's important him first. Um, and that's the only logical decision to make in the light of eternity. Yeah. So those are the three sections. And if you look carefully, you'll find the same in each one. So with Matthew, uh, same, same questions. Who do people say that I am? Uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus foretells his death. Same thing again. Uh, and then he says, uh, come, uh, come and follow me, right? And uh, Mark marks the same thing. Who do people say I am? He predicts his death. And then he says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So you can see that there's a lot of similarities between the three. But there's also lots of differences too, if you look carefully. Matthew's is much longer, much, much longer. Um, it's, it's got all of this stuff about... Uh, you know, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. On this rock, I will build my church. Da, da, da. You, that's not in Mark. 
and it's not in Luke. It's only in Matthew. Okay? Or there's this th part here about get behind me, Satan. Right? Uh, Mark's got that, and actually Matthew's also got that too. Uh, but Luke doesn't have that. Luke leaves that part out. But Luke includes other details that they don't have. Like So, for example, Luke says that, puts this in the context of Jesus praying. In fact, Luke mentions many times in his gospel about Jesus praying. Um, but the other gospels don't mention about Jesus, about Jesus praying. Luke says, take up your cross daily. The others don't use the word daily there and so on. So they're, they're recording the same event. There was one incident where Je when Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi, Matthew tells us that was in Caesarea Philippi. Um, the other, the other gospels do. Uh, uh, sorry, Mark also tells us it's Caesarea Philippi. Luke doesn't tell us the location. Um, so there was one incident in Caesarea Philippi where Jesus asked his disciples, "Who do people say I am?" And Peter said, "You are the Christ." And, and then the other things happened after it. Those were historical events. But in how Matthew and Mark and Luke recounted to us, you see they've they've shaped it in their own particular way to emphasize the particular things that they want to that they want us to learn and see. Right? Uh, so that's really that's really cool to uh, to see. So what again what we want to be doing is saying, well, why does Mark do it this way? Why does Matthew do it that way? Right? Then you're really uh, we're starting to listen carefully to what the gospel writers are saying. Okay, now let me stop sharing there. Now you'll see uh, on your on your lecture notes that, that we have the structure then of of the gospels, and I did say they have a similar uh, structure to them, isn't it? Uh, so the the three parts. Uh, let me just share my slide here. Okay, can you see that? Right. Uh, so, yeah, the, the three questions. So when you're thinking about Mark's gospel, these are three great questions to keep in mind. Who is Jesus? Like, what's his identity? Where's Jesus heading? Or why has Jesus come? Come to die on the cross. And uh, what does it mean to follow him? Right? Um, you know, the nature of discipleship and so on. And so you see the, the Gospels, they all have this similar structure. Prologue at the beginning, Jesus teaching up in Galilee, the turning point at Caesarea Philippi, um, a journey to Jerusalem, and uh, conflict with the religious leaders, and then his death and resurrection. They all have that same uh, structure or format um, to them. Yeah. Uh, so it raises a bit of a question for us, which is an interesting one to think about. How do you explain the fact that they're so similar and yet they're also different? You see, if, uh, you, know, if you submit your assignments at the end of this course, right, to, to Steph, I guess, and the marker is uh, you know, looking at your assignments and they see that there are three assignments that are, well, they're essentially the same. Right. I mean, there's a few minor differences between them, but they, they both have the same introduction. They make the same points. They have the same conclusion at the end. I mean, what's your marker going to conclude? They're probably going to conclude that you all went to chat GDP or whatever and asked them, please write my essay about Max Gospel, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, or one of you did that and the other rest of you copied uh, off the other one and, you know, copied and pasted or refined and replaced a few things, just hoping that the marker wouldn't notice that the things were the same. <laughs> right. So I guess the question here is then, you know, who copied who? If they're so similar, then who rolled it first and then who, who shaped it off the others? Right? Um, and I think this diagram helps you to really see the answer to this. Right. Um, and what this is saying is that 76% of Mark is also in uh, Luke and Matthew. 76% of Mark is also in Luke and Matthew. Uh, then there's a further eight, 18% that's in Matthew, but not in Luke. 
and 3% that's in Luke, but not in Matthew. So Mark only has 3% that is unique. It seems like a good candidate for being the first one to write, isn't it? Um, now, it also turns out that uh, Matthew and Luke have a lot in common as well. 23% of Luke, 25% of Matthew, um, they share, but it's not in Mark, uh, which seems to suggest that um, not only did Luke and Matthew borrow off Mark, but they also had another, another common source as well that was different, which they used in writing the gospel. Um, uh, and, and John is clearly quite different to the to, to, to the three. So there's been different different theories over the years. I don't really want to get into this too much. I mean, the early church believed Matthew was written first, um, and then Mark and Luke. Um, but you will find almost no one who thinks that today, except in Roman Roman Catholicism. I think it's still the position in Roman Catholic Church. But pretty much no one else you will find that believes that. Um, most people will believe that it's actually Mark that is written first, the so-called two-source um, hypothesis. And a simple way of putting that here is you have Mark wrote first. There's this common material that, that Mark and Luke both had, and then they had some of their own unique material that they used to, come to write their Gospels. In other words, Mark was written first. Yeah. Um, and so that's why it's a good one to study, apart from being shortest, right? Um, it was also the first one, right, uh, which Luke and Matthew have to some degree model or shape their own Gospels from it. Okay, let me stop there. Would you like to ask any questions? Um, I would like to ask a question. Yes. So it seems like uh, they have this source queue. It, I guess, could it mean that at one point there were many independent sources of the Gospel? Maybe somewhat similar, but with their own variation but over time they all in a sense died out and only left this four which is Matthew Mark right? was there other gospels I mean there, there were other kind of gospel like documents that was written much later you know in, in the second century or whatever sometimes the you know BBC or whatever when they want to try and make some scandal will dig them up as if Christians never knew about the gospel of Thomas or mm. whatever it was but no no they, they, they were written much later the, the church, only church only ever knew of four of four gospels mm. but but Luke tells tells us in chapter one verse one to four which you just read isn't it mm. that when he was writing his gospel um, that many had written had undertaken to mm. compile a narrative of the things that have happened and, mm. and Luke tells us that he he talked to those who were at the first were eyewitnesses um, of, of the word um, so it seems very likely that at least one of those um, narratives that he's talking about is Mark um, and presumably he also has another one um, as well that he shared that Matthew also had um, but how many there were and, and so on we, we we don't know because these documents didn't survive um, all we have is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Whatever their sources were, we don't have those anymore. Yeah. Um, so, you know, was there a document called Q? No, there is no document called Q. It's just, it's, it, we hypothesize that it, they, they, they must have had a common source because of the similar material, but we don't have any manuscripts that have that in it. I mean, maybe one day we'll dig it up, but we don't have it right now. Um, team, sorry. So, what exactly does Q stands for? Uh, it, it's a, it comes from a Latin word, uh, quell. Uh, quell, I think, what was written, I think, is what it. There are all kinds of interesting things that you can delve in deeper if you want to study the Bible. It's, uh, it can be really interesting. Ah, uh, Tim, yes, yes Jordan, go ahead. Um, okay, so from, from church tradition, it is held that uh, Matthew and John wrote their respective gospels. So we know that they are apostles, uh, whereas Mark and Luke are not apostles. So how did we come to uh, accept them as authoritative sources? We came to accept them because they're associated with the apostles. Yeah. Ah. Uh, you will, you'll see that in a moment with Mark. But as I said, also with Luke, he, he was travel companion with, with Paul and um, he's also associated with Peter in the New Testament too, and so on. So um, that's why the books of the New Testament are in. Um, it's essentially because uh, 
they're still apostolic, even and then I mean they weren't ap apostles themselves, but they're associated with the uh, uh, very closely associated with the apostles. That's why they. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then a, a follow up would be the uh, uh, regarding the authorship. I think uh, unlike the epistles, which clearly states like Paul at the start, yes, yeah. uh, in the Gospels we. Like Matthew doesn't say, uh, I'm Matthew, I'm writing this. Oh. Yeah, none of them say I'm, that. Yeah. They're, they were all strictly mm -hmm. anonymous. Um, uh, so, you know, the part that the, the titles that you have in your Bible, the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're not original. They're not in the original manuscripts. But those titles are very, very early, extremely early. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's various reasons why we, 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 we think that Matthew wrote it. We'll, we'll see that in, with Mark in a moment, but we could we can do similar things with the author. When were the original manuscripts? Were they like buried somewhere and someone found them, or was it just passed down? I mean, like how how did it even um, yeah come about? Yeah, so we have none of the original manuscripts, which is probably a good thing because based on the history of the church, they would be some kind of relics that. The church would probably, you know, try to worship or something like that. So it's probably a good thing that they were lost. But the original ones, they were they were then copied by scribes who who would then copy them and copy them and copy them and copy them. Um, and we have, as I said, maybe twenty thousand or more um, of these manuscripts. Some are just a little fragment, you know, just maybe a few letters or a word. Um, others are, you know entire new testament or the entire old testament or whatever but anyway, we have about twenty thousand of these uh, these ones so that's how you can work out what the original is it's something of a science it's a slightly bit of an art as well but if you can see that um you know these these uh these manuscripts they all had this reading and then this one was different um so which one was the original or which one was the mistake now various you know, there are various uh, ways that you can work out what the original is. If it's ever unsure, then you'll just find that as a footnote in your Bible, right? Um, that's where the footnotes come from. But they're usually of a very, very, very minor thing. It's not that, it's not that there's going to be some manuscript difference and then suddenly Jesus is not divine anymore or he's, he didn't die on the cross or there's no more eternal life for you. That, that's not how it works, you know. <laughs> they're, they're very minor things. It's like, okay, this one had an extra word and this one had the word and and this one didn't have and here yeah, or um, this one was spelt differently. This one had an extra I in it and this one didn't. They're, they're, they're very, there are some that are, that are maybe more important uh, we'll see that, for example, when we get to the end of Mark, you know, I think the last verse of Mark is 16, verse 8, and then you'll see a massive big footnote in your Bible that says that verses 9 to 20 are not in the original manuscripts. So there are some more important ones like that, um, that I will talk about that later. But on the whole, they're very, 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 very minor things that, that don't really make any difference. Yeah. So that's different to... to uh, to other other religions, just any other questions? Okay, I think we've only got another half an hour. Why don't we kind of get into Mark itself? And uh, I hope I can give you a bit of a teaser here of why this book is so great that we can. Uh, we can study it for the rest of of, of, of this uh, of this course. Okay, so uh, let's let's go there. All right, uh, let me share my slides here. Okay, so uh, we've already started to get into this, but first the authorship, right? So strictly, it's anonymous. Um, there's the title that was added later, but it was actually very early, the gospel according to Mark. So how do we know that Mark wrote the gospel of Mark? Well, there are certain things about its style. Um, it, it certainly has the style of an eyewitness account. There's lots of little details there that only an eyewitness could, could know. So there's things like, you know, that... Uh, Peter's mother-in-law was in, in bed with a fever and, and, and 
I mean, there's, there wasn't too many people that knew about that. I mean, Peter was there because it was his, it was his, his mother-in-law and so on, but um, it is clearly based on eyewitness, uh, eyewitness accounts. It has a Semitic style, that means a Hebrew, a Hebrew style, which fits with, with Mark, being, uh, Mark being author. But it's mainly the external evidence that's quite uh, suggestive along these lines. So here's some of the, some of the uh, quotes from the early church. Uh, firstly, Eusebius, uh, he writes this. Uh, uh, the elder used to say this. Mark became Peter's interpreter. He wrote accurately all that he remembered, not indeed in order of the things said and done by the Lord, for he had not heard the Lord nor had followed him, but later on followed Peter, who used to give teaching as necessity demanded, but not making, as it were, an arrangement of the Lord's oracles, so that Mark did nothing wrong, and in thus writing down single points as he remembered them, for to one thing he gave attention to leave out nothing of what he had heard and to make no false statements in them. Right? So you see what Eusebius is saying here. Um, he's saying that uh, he wrote down his gospel based on the teaching of Peter, which makes a lot of sense when you read the gospel of Mark, that it's Peter's mother-in-law, Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ, Peter's the one who denies Jesus three times, Peter's the one who's there at the tomb, Peter's the one up there on the mountain of transfiguration and so on. There's a lot of stuff about Peter in Mark's gospel, right? Um, that makes sense of this, yeah. Uh, Irenaeus, so 130 to 200 AD, uh, Peter and Paul were preaching the gospel in Rome and founding the church there. After their departure, Mark, Peter's disciple, has himself delivered to us in writing the substance of Peter's preaching. Uh, and then he continues, after the, the death of these, Peter and Paul, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, also handed down to us in writing the things preached by Peter. So again, it's, it's, it's very similar. It's called Peter's disciple. Um, he's writing down what Peter preached. Uh, Antimas Unite Prologue. Uh, these links here is where you can find these online if you want to read it in full, right? Mark declared he was called stump fingers because he had rather small fingers in comparison with the stature of the rest of his body. I like that little uh, <laughs> historical detail there. Um, he was the interpreter of Peter. After the death of Peter himself, he wrote down the same gospel in the region of Italy. Oh, that's interesting because uh, there tells you the tradition of where he wrote it from. Um, so if we say that Mark is written to a Gentile audience, well, that's not very surprising if he wrote it in Italy, right, which is where Rome is. Um, and Tertullian, while that gospel which Mark published may be affirmed to be Peter's, whose interpreter Mark, um, Mark was. So uh, you can see that the, the uh, kind of early church testimony here is quite um, consistent um, and, and also universal in its uh, the belief that, that that Mark John John Mark wrote this as as Peter's interpreter, right? and of course that's where the title of the Gospel according to Mark therefore came to be attached to it. Right? Uh, I think that the evidence is actually quite compelling, and there are very few people who will contest that. Actually, yeah. So who is this Mark? I mean, we said that Mark wrote it, but who who actually was he? The New Testament tells us quite a lot about him. Um, he was a resident of Jerusalem, Acts 12. He traveled with Paul and Barnabas on one of their missionary journeys, the first missionary journey. Um, he had a conflict with, with, uh, with uh, Paul, of course, and then they went separate ways later on. Uh, he didn't, so Paul didn't take him along on his second missionary journey. Um, instead, he traveled with Barnabas to Cyprus and other places. Um, he's the cousin of Barnabas, according to Colossians. Uh, he's in He's with Paul in Rome during his first uh, imprisonment uh, to Timothy. Paul asked Timothy to bring Mark to Rome. One of the, I mean, one of the beautiful details about that is that even though Mark and Paul clearly had a falling out when um, earlier on, they were reconciled by the end. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, and with, he's with Peter in Rome when he writes 1 Peter. Um, and so that's, that's helpful for us to see the association, direct association with Peter in his epistle. Um, so those are some of the things that we know about uh, Mark from the New Testament itself, which is consistent 
with the testimony of the, of the early church outside them. Okay, any questions? Okay, then the next one, uh, uh, we, we asked about the time of writing, um, probably about 63 to 68 AD. Peter's, we believe Peter died about 64 to 68. Um, was it written after his death or while he was alive or before he died? Uh, yeah, there are different theories. There are different theories about that. But generally, it's, it's, it's placed in that kind of, of, of time period. Um, and in terms of the uh, in, in terms of the situation, I think it's it's always important when you're looking at the Gospels to remember that uh, they're writing history for us, right? They're writing about real people. Uh, sorry, they're writing to real people about real events, uh, and they're writing to people who are in a real situation. Right? Um, so let me just give a couple of examples of that. We've already looked at how Mark begins, the beginning of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, you might know that uh, the Caesar around this time, they believed that they were the Son of God. You can find coins from this time period in history where the emperors refer to themselves as the Son of, the, the son of God because um, you know, some of the early emperors uh, thought of themselves as divine, like gods, um, and then their sons, therefore, refer to themselves as the son of the son of God, as you know, themselves kind of taking on this divine stature to them. And so, when Mark opens his gospel, saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you know, Christ the King, the Son of God, he's not talking about Caesar. Um, that's a that's a very very provocative thing to write um, in in the first century, uh, and so it's not it's not surprising then of course that the early Christians were persecuted. We know they were persecuted by the Jews, but they were also persecuted by the Romans too, um, and uh, and so uh, one of the big themes we'll see in Mark's gospel is of the the theme of fear and faith. And fear is presented as the opposite of faith. In many ways, Mark's goal is to encourage us to fearlessly, boldly proclaim the gospel, even though you're going to suffer for it. Um, uh, and perhaps why he's doing that is because he knows he's writing to Christians in the first century who are suffering at the hands of the Caesars and, um, and, and the Jews and so on. Right? So, Always remember that we're, we're talking about real events. It's written to real people who are in a particular situation um, and, uh, and, and therefore the gospel is shaped towards that, um, that, that particular audience. Okay, that's what we call historical context. Historical context, we're thinking what's going on in history at the time it was written. Now let's move to what we call the literary uh, context. What we're, now we're looking at as a piece of, 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 of literature. How did Mark actually go about writing this? And a good thing to always ask when you're reading literature is what is the purpose? And I think the purpose is there in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, right? It's not an explicit statement like in Luke and Matthew, but uh, Luke and John, but he begins his gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I think that's a, quite a clear marker that Mark wants us to focus on the identity of Jesus. And he wants us to conclude that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, to respond in repentance and faith to that. Um, that seems to be his kind of, you know, his big purpose, if you were, if you were to name uh, to name one. That doesn't mean he didn't have other sub-purposes along the way, right? But that seems to be a big one for him. And I think that's kind of uh, borne out in the structure of, of Mark's gospel too. So. Uh, let me share my slides here. So we've always already said that Mark is basically a gospel in two halves, right? With a turning point in the middle. And the turning point is where Peter says, you are the Christ, right? That's when Jesus starts predicting his death. He hasn't done that beforehand. Um, so 
the first part of Mark's gospel, uh, chapters one to eight, is really especially focusing on the question, who is Jesus? Or what is his, his identity? Right? Then we have the turning point or the pivot. Right? Then we have the second half of Mark's gospel. Um, there the, the, the focus shifts, um, especially to why has Jesus come and what does it mean to follow him? So chapters 8 to 10 has got a lot of stuff in it about discipleship and of course the last chapter has got a lot about his death and resurrection right? um, it doesn't mean that you have nothing about jesus um, mission or discipleship in chapters one to eight and it doesn't mean there's nothing about his identity in chapters nine to sixteen but in terms of the focus uh, that's how you can look at it uh, if you want to keep it really simple right gospel in two halves one to eight nine to sixteen who is jesus what does it mean to follow him Now we we could we could break it down you know further if we wanted to in you know different panels or or, or, or windows right so there you can see the turning point in the middle prologue at the start so this is the stuff of John the Baptist and then you've got these five main panels in between chapters one to four chapters four to eight chapters eight to ten eleven to thirteen fourteen to sixteen. We move from Galilee in the opening eight chapters, the journey to Jerusalem, and then in Jerusalem itself. Um, and there are these various, you know, themes or things that are repeated. Um, that's one of the ways that we can work out um, what the what the sections are. Now I've got at the top here, chapter one, verse one, chapter eight, verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine, and then chapter fifteen, verse thirty-nine, because they seem to be the main markers that show this kind of three-part structure to it. So let me pull it up and, and I'll show you what I mean. So first, let's have a look at Mark 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right. So there's two things we're told about Jesus there. He's called the Christ, and he's called the Son of God. You see that? Right. Now, when we get to the turning point, which is chapter 8, and Jesus says, who do people say I am? What does Peter say? He says, you are the Christ. And we as the readers know that that's the correct answer because Mark told us in the first verse, right? Takes the disciples eight chapters to realize, but Peter, the spokesman for the disciples, eventually gets the correct answer. Who is Jesus? He is the Christ. Um, and so that, that, that kind of rounds off the first eight chapters, which have been all about who is Jesus. Now, the next main place we see this is when Jesus is on the cross and this is very much a climax um, Jesus dies on the cross he breathes his last and then the Roman centurion when he sees that he the way in which he breathed his last he said truly this man was the son of God and it's very striking that in, in many ways Firstly, it's striking because who's saying this? He's a Roman centurion. He's not a Jew. He's not one of the disciples. He is a Gentile. He's a Roman soldier. But he recognizes Jesus is the Son of God. And when does he recognize that Jesus is the Son of God? What leads him to this conclusion? His death on the cross. Isn't that remarkable? Um, in, in many ways, Mark is saying that you, Jesus is enthroned, if you like, as king, seen as king, as he dies. He's lifted up on the cross. Um, of course, he has the sign above his head, right? This is the king of the Jews. He has the crown of thorns on his head and so on. Where do you see the kingship of Jesus as the Christ? On the cross as he dies for our sins because the christ came to die which is what we already read in the turning point just now 
So yeah, you can see even with those kind of things that you see repeated, Mark is showing us kind of the main, the, the main purpose um, and, and even something uh, of, of the structure of it. Now, how do, you, how do you read the Gospels? How do you kind of understand their meaning clearly? I think very often we're, off, we're actually not very good at reading the Gospels. I mean, we, sometimes we just, we, we really get stuck on the surface and we don't get the main point of things that is being said. So here's a few tips, I guess, and, uh, which I'll give you up front and then we'll see how this works out in the following weeks. The first thing when you're reading the Gospels, and especially when you're reading Mark's Gospel, is look for repetitions. Look for uh, repetitions. There's lots of things that are repeated. Let me share the slides again. Right? So being in the boat by the sea happens lots of times. Crossing the sea. There's three passion predictions. There's three trips to the temple. Uh, Jesus heals two blind men. Right? There's two episodes of feeding crowds, five feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000, and around those two episodes, there's lots of talk about bread. Um, there's two episodes of who is the greatest, and right next to that, there's, there's quite a number of episodes that talk about children. Um, uh, there's a number of questions that is asked Jesus. Shall we pay taxes to Caesar? Which, you know, which uh, which commandment is the greatest, and so on? And then Jesus has his own um, his own question that he poses. So there are these there are these things, and if you look closely here, these repetitions are grouped together, right? So Jesus teaching by the boat in the sea. That's that's all kept to chapters one to four, right? And then the crossings of the sea, well, that's in the second window here, the sea crossings. The passion predictions, all three passion predictions are here in chapters 8 to 10. The three trips to the temple, guess where they are? They're all here, right? Um, and, and, and so on. Uh, and, and there are little, you know, some of these other ones is also here. So the feeding, you know, the, the, the two feedings are both in chapters 4 to 8. Uh, the teaching about who is the greatest, that's all in chapters 8 to 10, it's kind of discipleship stuff. The questions is all, is all here in chapters 11 to 13 as Jesus has this uh, conflict with the religious leaders. Um, so actually, you know, when, when Mark's writing his gospel, he, he doesn't put chapters, he doesn't put uh, verse numbers, all those are added in much later on um, by editors of the Bible, right? Um, the early manuscripts, they don't even have spaces between the letters, and sometimes they don't even bother to put the vowels in. They only put the consonants because they want to save space. Yeah. Um, so how do you work out how to structure it? They use these kinds of uh, literary devices to show you how you're moving from one section to the next or from one theme uh, to the next. So let's just have a, have a look at a couple, of, a, a couple of these. Let me share my Bible. And, and show you a couple of these. So the first one, uh, let's look at the, the sea crossings. Okay, so the first sea crossing, chapter 1, verse 16. So just after the prologue, which I think ends at verse 15. Uh, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Next part we see is chapter 2, verse 13. He went out again beside the sea. And notice that word again there. Um, that's Mark's not so subtle way of reminding us. Hey, do you remember this is not the first time that this uh, happened? You need to remember that this already happened in chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, he went out again beside the sea. All the crowd was coming to them. He was teaching them, right? Uh, then chapter 3, verse 7. And again, note that you, you see the progression that's happening here. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee, Judea, uh, Idumea, from beyond the Jordan, from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed so many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. 
right? So now you see the crowd is, it starts off as just a few disciples, then there's a crowd. Now there's a great crowd that's coming from everywhere. Uh, and so they have to get the boat ready, but he doesn't get into the boat yet. Okay. And then chapter four, verse one, again, he get, began to teach beside the sea, a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat on it. The whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. So, I mean, that's just a very minor thing. You think, well, what does it matter about Jesus being beside the sea and the crowds getting bigger and, and, and so on? But Mark's actually using this as a, as a structuring device. And we can break down chapters one to four into those sections just based on these uh, uh when Jesus passes by the sea. We'll see this probably next in the, in, in the following weeks. Uh, so you see, you see a similar thing with the, with the sea crossings. Uh, the passion predictions is, it would be another one, good one to see. So we've already seen the first passion prediction. Um, the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected, be killed, and after three days rise. Then we have another passion prediction, chapter 9, verse 31. Son of man will be delivered into the hands of men. They'll kill him when he's killed. After three days, he will rise again. Chapter 10. Again, a third passion prediction. This one longer than the other two. So that, this is one of the things to, to look out for when you're reading the Gospels. Look out for repetitions. Um, they're often used to make uh, a point. Uh, another thing to look out is what I call uh, Mark and sandwiches. Actually, I prefer to call them Mark and hamburgers because I think hamburgers are much more exciting than sandwiches. But uh, you know, what are the what are the key parts of a hamburger? Uh, you have uh, bread, you know, the bun on either side, and then you have some fillings in the middle. But especially, it's about the meat, right? I mean, you you don't buy a hamburger to eat the bread, right? And you you don't buy a hamburger to eat lettuce or something like that. You buy a hamburger to eat the meat. The bread's really just there to help you to eat the meat, isn't it? Um, so Mark and Sandwich is like this, right? You have the bread on the outside. You have two episodes that are very similar on either side of a third episode that's in the middle, which is different but related. And, in fact, the thing in the middle is the key. Mark loves to use these Mark and sandwiches. Let's just have a look at a couple of, uh, of examples of, of this. So let's have a look at chapter 3, verse 20. So we start off in verse 20. He went home again, a great crowd gathered, so they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he's out of his mind, right? So Jesus' family thinks he's crazy. On the other side, again, we've, we're on the topic of family, right? And his mothers and brothers came, standing outside. They sent to him, called him. Why are they doing that? Because they think he's crazy, right? And Jesus says, well, who are my real mothers and brothers? You know, it's those who does the will of God. Those are, he is my brother and sister and mother. So you can see those things on the outside is very similar. And in the middle... You've got this episode about uh, you know, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the scribes are saying that Jesus is, he can cast out demons because he's the prince of demons. Right? And Jesus explains, no, I'm not working for Satan. Um, why would Satan try to defeat himself? That just doesn't make any sense. No, I've come to defeat Satan. My miracles show that I've, I'm the stronger man who's come to um, you know, bind up Satan and, and, and free people from him, right? Uh, so do you see how this is working? Jesus is crazy. Jesus is crazy. Jesus is the prince of demons. No. Who was Jesus? He's the strong man come to bind Satan. They're related. And the thing in the middle is the key. Uh, another one, chapter 5. Uh, this one is really very obvious. I think you, you've, you've got G Jairus. Is coming to Jesus because his daughter is at the point of death. Um, and Jesus begins his journey to, uh, to, to help Jairus' daughter. But while he's on the way, he gets interrupted by this woman who has a flow of, had a flow of blood for 12 years. And she touches Jesus' garments and 
and she's healed, right? And while all this is happening, Jairus' daughter dies, and then Jesus goes in and rise, raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. So it's quite obvious that this is a sandwich. Start with Jairus and his daughter. We end with Jairus and his daughter. And Mark puts this other episode right here in, uh, in, in the middle of it. Uh, let's just look at one last example. Uh, this is one that often we get very, very confused about. And this is the episode of the fig tree. Right? Um, so Jesus sees a fig tree. He finds nothing but leaves because it's not the season for, pig, for figs. And then Jesus curses the fig tree and says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And we think, come on, Jesus, what's, what's, what's going on? It's not the season for figs. Why are you so angry that there's no fruit here? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you cursing the fig tree? And he, he actually comes back to the fig tree just after it. Right? Uh, he goes into Jerusalem, he comes back out, and then you know the fig tree is dead, withered to its roots. What's the point of the fig tree? Why does Jesus curse the fig tree? Well, this is a Mark and sandwich. And in the middle, Jesus cleanses the temple. Now, what would help you to make sense of all this is if you realized that the fig tree in the Old Testament was one of the metaphors to describe Israel. Right? So Jesus comes as the Jewish Messiah. He's expecting fruit, especially as he comes into the temple. And that's not what he finds. He finds money changes and so on, but not people welcoming him as the Messiah. Uh, and so what is happening with the fig tree, uh, as in there's going to be judgment that is going to be coming on Israel for their rejection of the Messiah. What's happening in the middle, the meat, helps you to make sense of what is happening on the, uh, on, on the outside. So Mark loves these, uh, these, these Mark and sandwiches. This one also helps you to see that another kind of thing to, to really keep in mind here is uh, that we need to look out for Old Testament illusions again if you don't know about the fig tree in the old testament you're going to be really confused about jesus cursing the uh, cursing the fig tree but there are lots of these kind of things that you find in the gospel so another another example um jesus says they were like sheep without a shepherd um that's actually a quotation from a couple of places in the old testament um or at jesus uh, transfiguration or at his baptism similar words this is my beloved son, listen to him. Uh, or Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane, remove this cup from me. What cup? What, what cup is he talking about? If you read the Old Testament, you'll be able to make sense of what he's talking about here. So look for repetitions. Look for these sandwiches in particular. Look for Old Testament illusions. All this, all this is showing you that. The gospel writers have very carefully crafted what they're writing. You see, it's it's not just a random collection of stories that they have strung together. It's carefully and thoughtfully arranged to teach a, a message. They're theologians who want us to understand who Jesus is and why he came. Respond rightly to them. So often, but often we just miss what they're saying because we don't notice the repetition. We don't see the sandwiches. We don't, we're not maybe very familiar with the Old Testament. We just, it just kind of washes over our heads and we think, oh yeah, Jesus is doing miracles. That shows that he's from God. Oh well, yes, it does show that he's from God. But there's more that is being communicated than just that simple, uh, simple truth. Another thing to think about when you're thinking about the gospels is the characters, right? It's a narrative. In a narrative, you care about the setting, you care about the plot, you care about the characters, right? Uh, so there are various characters. As Jesus is the main character, of course. You've got the opponents. Any good story will have the bad guys in it. Uh, you've got the disciples who are usually quite dumb and confused most of the time. You've got the crowds who uh, gather around Jesus but never really believe in him. And then you've got the suppliants, these individuals that come to Jesus, like, uh, like Jairus, um, or the woman with the with the blood. These are usually the model characters um, that that we are to identify with. And the gospel writer Mark uses these characters to help us to think about how we should respond to Jesus. 
So as we see how Jairus responds to Jesus or the woman responds to Jesus or how the Pharisees respond to Jesus, we think, is that a good response or is that a bad response? And what's my response? Am I going to respond like them or am I going to respond in some other way? So the characters draw you into the story and are actually one of the ways in which the gospel writers bring about a response in your heart as, as the reader. Um, the plot, right? So any, any good story will have a, uh, has a very sim simple structure to it. Uh, if you ever like Lord of the Rings, for example, how does, uh, how does Lord of the Rings work? Uh, well, you start in Bag End, right? And it's Bilbo's birthday and all of that. Um, uh, that's the setting. And then you need a problem, right? Any good story has a problem. And of course, in that in Lord of the Rings, then it's the ring, you know, the the one, the one ring. And things things uh, get exciting pretty fast from there, you know. The, soon Frodo's going off with the ring, and there's dark riders who are chasing after them, and you, you know they have to travel through dark tunnels and I'm not going to spoil the whole thing for you right but it takes three movies to go through the whole thing but there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that happens um and each movie has its own climax to it but the big climax is in the third movie isn't it where you've got Frodo he's holding the ring is he going to destroy it or is Gollum going to get it or is Sauron going to get it or what's going to happen it's this you know this great tense moment um and you know then it all gets resolved right and uh eventually it ends you know they're back at they're back at bag end and it's all, all happily ever ever after that's any good movie any good book has that kind of structure to it the gospels have that structure to it even the individual episodes have that kind of structure to it like with Jairus you meet Jairus his daughter's on the point of death uh, Jesus gets interrupted. She's already dead. He, go, he puts everyone outside. All right, then he raises her from the dead. And we come out here and there's a new, there's a new setting. It leads on to the, on, on to the, next, the next story. So the gospel writers are kind of master storytellers. Um, and it, it's helpful to just be aware of that. Um, if, if you're ever trying to teach them is to just realize how they're telling the story. Story. It will help you to tell the story in a more interesting way too. Okay, let me pop that. Okay, and then we can look for some some themes, and these are some of the themes that you will see in Mark's Gospel: Kingdom of God, Identity of Jesus, Fear versus Faith, Proclaiming the Gospel, um, the Necessity of Jesus' Death, the Nature of Discipleship. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to these in the in, in the following. Uh, the following weeks but those are some of the big things i guess that mark is uh, is on about let me just pause there any last questions you want to ask before i kind of bring things together and wrap us up for tonight i had a question uh, but i think this is better for, for when we get to it uh, it's regarding the centurion's uh, pronunci pronunciation that jesus is the son of god so from the centurion's point of view, being a Roman, how, how should we understand uh, what he's trying to say when he says uh, this person is the son of God? It means he's the king. Yeah, he's the divine, divine king. Yeah, um, because that's what Caesar's claimed, you see. That's the kind of historical context. And he's a Roman centurion, right? So he'll be well, well aware with, of the claims of Caesar, you know. Um, yeah, he's he's the divine king. I think that's what um, that's probably it, what he had in his mind. Yeah, uh, is it a common uh, title that's been thrown around in in common literature that yeah that Caesar is the son of God? Yes, it's very common. Yeah, as I said, it's on all the coins. You can you can dig up coins where it has that minted on it. Yes, it's very common. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I mean, even whatever whatever's going on in the mind of the, 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 you know, the centurion, centurion, that's the conclusion also that Mark wants you to come to as well. Because right, we're, we're seeing things through the eyes of this, you know, of the various characters and so on, and that's the conclusion that Mark wants us 
as Gentiles are said to come to is we see the death of Jesus. You know, what do you see as you see this man hanging on the cross naked and crucified? Do you just see a pathetic, you know, criminal? That, or, or, or do you see the divine son of God? Um, yeah, it, it's very powerful, actually, um, uh, the, the way that Mark forces us to think, who, who is this person? Who do you think he is? And, and therefore, how will you respond to him? Okay, let me kind of summarize the essence of what we've looked at today. It doesn't really matter if you've understood everything that I've talked about. We've covered quite a lot of ground. Uh, I know that. Uh, here are the main points, right? Here are the takeaway points. If you've been struggling, here's the time to tune back in again, right? This is what we learned tonight. We learn about the gospel, right? The gospel message. The gospel message is all about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. It's the good news, Christ died as our savior and was raised as our king. That's the overall message of the Bible and all the books of the Bible. Um, there's one gospel message, but there are four gospels matthew mark luke and john they're a unique genre and what the gospels are doing are preaching the gospel and seeking the response to the gospel that's why they're focused on jesus that's why they're focused on his death and resurrection and they're all about helping the reader to respond in repentance and faith um, and these gospels are different to one another. They have their own unique audience that they're written to, their own unique purposes and so on. That's why they're written in different styles. And uh, we want to listen carefully to what this particular gospel um, uh, is, is about. And we're going to focus on the gospel of Mark, who wants us to see that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. And he wants us to put our faith in him um, and not be afraid to proclaim him, even though uh, persecution will, will, will result from it. Um, we're going to see more in the following week. So next week, we're kind of going to dive in and we'll look at, uh, we'll start with Mark chapter one. Um, so how about I, I, I leave this in prayer as we, as we wrap up for tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the good news. Uh, thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior and King. Lord, thank you that you do not punish us as we deserve, but Jesus came to die. He died the death we deserve. He was raised again to conquer death and give us eternal life. Lord, thank you so much for the grace and mercy you have shown to us. Thank you, Lord, for how the gospel spread throughout the ancient world. Thank you how it's been passed down by Christians from generation to generation to us. Thank you for working by your Holy Spirit in the, in the, in the, in the writers of the Bible, like Mark, um, so that we can know who Jesus really is. And so be with us as we go through the rest of this course. We pray, Lord, that this would not just be about learning facts or knowledge, but you would really transform our lives, that you would help us to appreciate deeper and deeper who Jesus really is. Help us to understand more fully why he had to die on that cross. And Lord, please challenge us to follow him, um, radically follow him as the king of our life. Um, so Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this first session this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.